Hey everybody, Brad Eaton back here with the Dirt Podcast. We're back here at Day Air Ballpark. A little different this time, the Dirt Podcast is not just audio anymore. We're actually going to do some video as well, introduce you to one of our players today. So here at Day Air Ballpark, I'm joined once again by Andrew Hayes, our co-host. Hey. And today we're also joined by Dragons relief pitcher Jake Gozo. Jake, thanks for joining us on the podcast today. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right. Well, hey, so we're going to talk about your career here in a little bit because that's a really cool story I think we want to hear. But... A little bit of current events first. So last night's ball game, as has a tendency to happen every once in a while here in the spring in Ohio, Mother Nature did not cooperate with us. Nice little rain delay into, unfortunately, a rain out, which means we've got two games today. But for the fans listening or watching at home, tell us a little bit about what it's like as a player when you've got a rain delay and then ultimately getting something rained out. What do you guys do during that time frame? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Well, it just depends. Um, you know, if if we're really wanting to play, we have two different dances. We have a rain dance and we have a non-rain <laughs> dance. Um, so it just depends. You know, if we've had a long week and we don't want to play, maybe get a little extra rest, then we'll do the rain <laughs> dance. But if not, then we won't, then we'll do the non-rain dance. Um, but yeah, other than that, we play cards. Uh, we play a lot of cards. We play. We've recently picked up this game called AC Ducey. Okay. And we've been. Uh, some people have been a little upset. Because we do play with a little bit of money, so All right. it gets things going down there. A little fun, um, yeah. A little bit of just dollars, like nothing yeah. crazy. Um, but uh, yeah, we just play a lot of cards and kind of just hang out. A lot of guys are either just on their phones or talking to their family or just kind of relaxing. So who's the resident card shark downstairs at AC Ducey? Uh, you know, believe it or not, uh, Lahair has been getting in there lately. And he's been uh, <laughs> he's been taking some money, so it's 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 pretty fun. But we can't wait to win some of that money back against him. So yeah, I bet right, former major league guy. You're like, hey, this isn't fair. We're still in the minors. We're still right. working our way up, man. Right, he's already made it. You know, so um, yeah. But yeah, it's it's a lot of fun playing cards down there. Who's the one down there that you're like, I can't wait to go up against an ACDC? You're like, that dollar's mine. <laughs> oh, you know, probably my roommate Nick Hansen. You know, I, I love taking his money too. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, we played a lot of ACDC. We also play this called Chinese poker, and it's you play poker hands, and it's usually about four people. Okay. Um, and it's pretty fun too. So you have a five card hand, a two card hand, and a one card hand. Yeah. Um, and it's just just passes the time quite a bit. So. Right, so then you're waiting on, and, and you know a lot of times you have a rain delay, and, and you do get the game in, right? It might be a little bit later, so mm-hmm. what's it like when you guys have to kind of gear back up at that point? Does that take long? Is it just something you're used to? Um, honestly, I think it's just something we're used to, you know, um, especially as, like, speaking from, like, a relief pitcher standpoint, um, you know, the first couple innings of, innings of the game, uh, we're kind of just enjoying the game as, like, with the fans, you mm-hmm. know, like, because... As relief pitchers, once our name's called, then the adrenaline goes, and like we will snap into like a, you know, time to play. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of guys just have kind of got it down to where they can kind of turn it on pretty fast. So when the lights go on, it's kind of it's showtime. Yeah, you know. How much time do you need from the time that coach calls your name to like, all right, I'm taking the mound? Um, <clears throat> how much time do we need, or how much time do we get? Well, that's <laughs> <a good laughs> yeah. two different numbers. <laughs> um, yeah, it's honestly so. They kind of in the off season and like in spring training, um, <clears throat> the Reds kind of train you to to be like ten away. Okay. So like once your name's called, like ten pitches and and you're in, you know, because sometimes there's not much time out there, right. like because the game can change so fast. Um, so I mean, I mean, probably like a couple minutes, honestly, and then you can you can be ready to go. How much time <laughs> would you like to have, ideally? How much time would we like to have? Um, you know, that's actually funny that I say that because I, I thought I used to need more time, but I mean, honestly, you only need, like I said, three or four minutes because at the end of the day, as a relief pitcher, you kind of thrive off the adrenaline and like, oh, let's go, let's get going quick. So we're not, it's a different breed than like starting pitching, you know? Um, So, I mean, I think less time, the better now that I've realized because then your adrenaline just kicks in. It's like, you know, either you're ready or you're not, you know, so it's exciting. We talked to Graham Ashcraft last year, red starting pitcher now, and, and he was going through the whole thing of, all of these details i mean it was like a 35 or 40 minute process Mm -hmm. but he said that through that some of those things he was getting actually like really helped his performance in the long term but you know he has a completely different story he's trying to last four or five six innings maybe versus you you're coming in you're like i need to go a half inning maybe Mm -hmm. an inning maybe two innings at most and just come in there and throw as hard as you can right pretty much man like you like garmin our uh, pitching coach he's he's uh 
pretty much saying like give us everything you have like if you have six pitches that day give us a hundred percent you know it is a totally different beast than starting pitching for sure you just come in there get the job you know blow your gasket and then get out of there so that's yeah. why they got more relievers in the pen right yeah exactly <laughs> next guy up you know that's like you said like the starting pitchers sometimes they're so ritualistic where it's like i need to listen to my my five you know hour playlist i need nobody to talk to me for two hours like it's so mm-hmm. crazy, and then like you said, you guys are a totally different breed. Where it's like, hey, I need you in thirty-four seconds to go take them out. And you're like, yeah. all right, here's exactly. ten pitches for you. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. It's like the so when we had Castillo come down for the uh, rehab assignment, because um, we knew somebody was going to be a bridge guy from him to Abbott, yeah. and I had a feeling that I was one of the last relievers hot, and I'm like, well, I'm probably going to bridge it. And <clears throat> when he got bases loaded, he had a pitch count of fifty, and we had a bases loaded. And I was like. Garmin told me I have he's got six pitches left in the game so I got to run down there and get hot and it's just like you know you just get thrown into the fire but I think that's what we live on you know like we thrive off that and you know it's it's a pretty cool general rush at the end of the day would have preferred to probably not have to come in with the bases loaded in that situation right though, right? right but I <laughs> at mean, least they're not your runners on your ERA though <laughs> yeah but I mean that's the thing like as a reliever like you have the mindset of like those are my runners too you yeah. know what I mean because there's going to be a time when you know the situation happens and you get pulled and your runners are on base and you want that guy to like protect those runners like yep. they're yours because you know stats are everything yeah you know so yeah but uh you know it was fun so cool. for you what's the most nerve-wracking situation to come into like is it being down being tied being up and having to protect like what's your um, mindset going into that honestly like I wouldn't even view it as like nerve wracking. I think it's more like which which outings are like exciting and which outings are kind of like oh, it's just another outing. Yeah. Like the most exciting outings and like you know the most like adrenaline. I keep saying adrenaline because yeah. like that's what it's just it's what kind of we live off of, you know. Um, but the most exciting is when we're up, you know, and you have a save opportunity. You know, like you have a te- you have a chance to close the door, and you know win the ball game. Like that's that's the best time to come in, you know, and close games too. I mean, or like. Even, like, the situation when, you know, you got bases loaded, you know, you have to pull your starting pitcher, you come out and you stop that rally. Like, Mm -hmm. that's huge. You know what I mean? That changes the whole momentum of the game. So just situations like that, that honestly mean the most. Or just, it's the best to come into. How much does crowd play into what you're doing? Oh, a ton. Yeah. Man, like, like, especially the, the environment here in Dayton, you know, it's just, it's so much more fun than a lot of the other places we play. Um, and we played in Fort Wayne this past week, and I mean they have a nice place. Like, mm-hmm. The stadium's beautiful, um, but the, just the environment just wasn't there. You know, and the environment plays into it quite a bit. Yeah, nobody wants you to win there either, right? No, nobody <laughs> yeah. wants you to win. That's right. That's right. But yeah, but, but yeah. I mean the fans do a really good job here, and you guys do a great job because it's it's fun to play. That's awesome. So we've talked a lot about pitching already, but what I think a lot of people probably don't realize, right? They see you, they see you on the staff. And they assume you've probably always been a pitcher, but that wasn't the case, right? So having done a little research and and the folks in my radio broadcast team that have given us some information, it's like, I think it would be cool to kind of take a trip chronologically through your baseball story because it's gone through quite a few twists and turns just over the last four or five years here uh, to get to where you're at now. So for, for the fans listening at home and watching here, it's like, Tell us a little bit about, you know, you come out of high school, you grew up in California, you go to Oklahoma Baptist, which, or actually first you go to a junior college, right? Mm-hmm. And then you go to a D2 school. So, but at that point you were a hitter, right? You were infielder and thought that, that was going to be your path, hopefully into the pros. So tell us a little bit about that and, and kind of the journey through college. Yeah, um, <clears throat> pretty much. So I pitched a little bit in high school. Um, had some arm issues in high school and just it wasn't fun at that age you know I just wanted to play um, so I ended up going to junior college Orange Coast College mm-hmm. um, didn't really play my first year got to play time my second year got an offer to go to Oklahoma Baptist out from in Oklahoma which is quite a change like my <laughs> second and no like, longer Southern California oh yeah I mean I grew up <laughs> I grew up in Redlands which is inland about an hour inland from the from the coast okay. and um, the junior college I went to, like my second year, I was on the beach pretty much. You know, I could ride my skateboard to the beach. So, and once, and the quick story, but I got a phone call from this Oklahoma number, and it was like the most country accent I've ever had in my <laughs> life. And I'm like, what in the world is going on? I just came from the beach, and I'm getting, you yeah. know, and it, was, it was Chris Cox who, who's the head coach and at Oklahoma Baptist now. He was the assistant at the time. Um, but yeah, went on a, went on a recruiting visit, and then uh, 
fell in love with it, honestly, like, and moved out to Oklahoma. Um, and then I actually changed positions when I moved out to Oklahoma. Okay. So I was a first baseman, um, and then I changed positions to an outfitter because I can move well for my size. Um, always, I, I had a good arm. Like, I always knew I had a good arm. Um, but, uh, and I just knew there was more opportunity. Like, first baseman's, like, you can just be more valuable if you can play in the outfield. Mm -hmm. So I knew that from the get-go and had a good junior year. Um, did what I needed to do. Played played some summer ball up in uh, Redding, California. Had a good summer. Uh, came back for senior year, and um, pretty much there was some word that I needed to hit some certain amount of home runs and a certain amount of RBIs, and um, finished my senior year with 20 bombs and 70 plus RBIs, and you know did what I needed to do and went down to Houston for a pre-draft workout. Thought for sure I was going to get drafted, um, and then just didn't happen on draft day. Uh, so, you know, that kind of shook a little bit. Yeah. Um, What's that like when you're, I mean, you're waiting for the call and you keep waiting and you're like, and you start to worry and all of a sudden you get to the end. It's like, what happens then? Like, what's going through your brain at that point? Yeah. I mean, I remember watching the draft. Like, I remember um, sitting on my couch in Shawnee, Oklahoma, and watching it on my computer and just seeing name after name called. Like, because I got called, like, um, the area scout called me before day two and was like, hey, you know, we have senior money for you and we're going to pick you here. So are you ready to go? Ready to be an angel? Um, didn't happen, you know, and, hmm. and day three came along, didn't happen. And just pick after pick, it kind of takes a little bit out of you every time, yeah. you know, and I was in a pretty like, it was, it was probably the darkest place I've been, like, you know, for 22 years of my life at the time. So it was definitely a uh, gut check. Was there at any point you had to have like plan B ready? Um, yeah, I mean, I graduated in four years for a reason. Like I knew like academics was always a big deal. Like my, my mom always stressed it. My dad always stressed it. Like I knew I was, I was going to get my degree. Like that yeah. was, that was always the plan B. You know what I mean? Like uh, I knew that basically you can't play forever. It doesn't matter who you are. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, then I, I went down to Dallas and got a sales job. Um, and it was just like a headhunter company, a staffing company at the time. And I was going to take it, but they gave me a couple weeks just to relax and kind of think about it. Um, and then I got a call from Evansville Otters at the time. So and then uh, got a call from them saying they need a outfielder to fill in. First baseman will offer you a contract. And uh, so then I turned down the Dallas job. I was like, I'm, I'm going to go play. You know, I'm going to go play some baseball. Turn down that big sales job money, huh? Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. For the dream of playing independent league that's ball. That's right. That's right. Probably not the most glamorous move, I'm guessing, right? Yeah. No, in any ball, yeah. It was. Yeah. It, it's not, man. I mean, you know, the living conditions and, I mean, you just got to really want it. Yeah. You know, and, and a lot of guys do down there. It's, it's pretty interesting to see, like, the passion that's down there. And, um, I mean, it's good players too. I mean, there's so much, there's so many good players and so much talent out there that just never get the opportunity, you know, that probably deserve the opportunity. So there's a, there's a gap there then where you go to Evansville Otters as, you know, a, a hitting player. And now you are in the Reds organization as a pitcher. There's a big bridge there. What happened in that time frame to say, okay, I went from my time with the Evansville Otters to now into the Reds organization as a pitcher. Yeah, um, so I was in Evansville for about two weeks, uh, got released. They only gave me about like six at-bats, so, you know, then it was another gut check time. It's like, you know, now what am I going to do? Um, so I remember driving back to St. Louis, or St. Louis, and I had, I grabbed a hotel. I was like, I'm going to stick around the area because that's where the Frontier League was pretty much located, that I could drive to another team if they offered me another contract or mm -hmm. whatever. So I stayed there at night, kind of just you know, realized that, you know, maybe I need to think of a different way. And at the time, uh, my sister and brother-in-law just moved out to Arizona. And my brother-in-law, he's a physical therapist, and he wanted to start his own company. So he wanted to open up his own practice. And he told me, he's like, hey, you know, we need, we need help with some marketing. You know, we need help with um, pretty much just getting our name out there, going to talk to doctors to send us some patients. Mm -hmm. So if you want to come help us out, like, and come move back to Arizona. Um, so I ended up doing that for a while. I uh, did that for about, I don't know, probably about six months. Um, and then also started like training on the side. So Scott Shebler, who was up with the Reds in 2017, 2019, up in the mm -hmm. big leagues. Yeah. Yep. Um, he was a, he's a family friend of mine. And he was like, 
dude, like you, because his at the time his agent was my advisor during the draft, and he's like, dude, there there was like, you need to play baseball. Like there was a reason. Like you just don't slip through the cracks like that. I don't know what happened, dude, but like something happened, mm-hmm. right? And he's like, we know you have a good arm, like. Because I went to, so backtrack real quick. I went to, in 2018 and 20, 2019, over uh, Christmas and New Year's, I went to the Power Showcase and mm-hmm. won the Power Showcase in Miami. And, like, it was clocked, like, 95, 96 from the outfield. So, like, and I've never, I didn't know I threw that hard from the outfield, um, which honestly isn't that hard anymore. Some of the guys are throwing 100 <laughs> from the outfield. Um, the time, it was great. At the time, <laughs> I was like, sweet, like, I got a pretty decent arm. Um, but anyway, so... Going back, he's like, you know, we have – Scott was saying, you know, we we know you have a good arm. Like, you know, just start playing catch, start training your body. Maybe you can be a pitcher again. So we just started playing catch. Me and Scott started – you know, he's an outfielder. He doesn't have a very good arm. He knows that he's a hitter. That's yeah. why he's in the league, you know. Um, but started playing catch and um, still working on the side. And uh, hopped on the mound and threw a bullpen, and I was sitting like 93 to 94, 95. So – um, yeah, long story short, uh, Scott was close to Darren Ebert, who was in the Orc. He's now yep. with the Angels. Um, and Ebert came out and watched one of my pens, and he's like, dude, that's, I mean, it's coming out of your hand a little different. You know, like, so then he brought it into the Reds, and then the Reds brought me in the following week. And um, after that, Bodie offered me a contract. And then, so now I'm, now I'm a pitcher, long story short, when it comes to that, so. One of the favorite things I read was from Ebert's scouting report of you, and I wrote it down. It says, he is a Division II outfielder with the body of a professional pitcher on a crummy mound throwing 95. <laughs> <laughs> so That's obviously, awesome. like, now, other than being on probably a little nicer mound throwing 95, like, what, how does that translate? How do you go from throwing, you know, mid-90s in the outfield with a crow hop to being a well-rounded pitcher? Because... You know, at this level, and as you go up, right, throwing mid nineties just doesn't get it done. You got to do. Mm-hmm. You got to be a well-rounded person with, you know, off-speed stuff and secondary pitches. How long did that process take for you to say, okay, I'm going to go from a guy that throws hard to an actual pitcher? Yeah, I mean, I'm still, I'm still going through that process. <laughs> I'll man. let you know in a couple of years. Um, three years. <laughs> yeah, you know. So last year, the Reds had a different little mindset in the org, like through the org, like, you know, we want you to just be a thrower, throw hard, you know, it'll in your stuff will play, get the job done. This year's a little different. Um, you know, it's, it's more focused on like knowing who you are, you know, like what, what are your, what are your skills? And like you said, like 95 just isn't, it doesn't blow guys away as it used to, you know, it mm-hmm. still can if you use it right. You know, a hundred's the new 95. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just a lot of like, so when I, so I signed in February 2020. Um, perfect timing, right? Perfect timing. Yeah. Are you kidding me? Yeah, that's another thing. Like, <laughs> sign yeah, this and go dude. sit at home for six months. Right, exactly. Yeah. You know, and you know, finally get an opportunity with an organization, and then COVID hits. It's mm-hmm. like, oh, well, there's another smack in the face, you know. Yeah. But Are during you that, wonder at this point, you're like, every time you like, think what? something's gonna happen, you just get smoked. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, but I don't know. I just just was raised a little different and just re- raised relentless, you know, and I just, I knew, I just always knew that, you know, just keep going. You know, I, I just, I knew there was something else, but long story short, went out to Oklahoma, ba- I moved back to Oklahoma during COVID and moved back to my college because mm-hmm. my college had a nice facility. My coach was open, didn't have to pay for it. Um, and he had all the technology I needed um, and just started just hammering it out. Like, I didn't know what I was doing. Like I'm out yeah. there like doing pitching drills and I'm like, I used to hate pitchers, but now I'm a pitcher, <laughs> you know, like I used to make fun of the guys yeah, that were exactly. doing these drills. Look at me now. Right. I used to make fun of guys who say their arm hurts and like, hey, let's go, just throw, you know? Yeah. But, um, yeah, it's just a lot of just time and like time with yourself. Like, and as a, as a hitter, like I used to love just spending hours in the cage, you know, mm-hmm. just hitting. Cause that, that was just enjoyable. Um, and like as a pitcher, you can't throw all the time. So that was a learning curve. Like, cause you can't just go throw a thousand throws a day. Like there's just, it's just not feasible. Um, so it just was really like doing a lot of research of like how your body moves, you know, I I had a good arm, but like, I, that's not sustainable. You know what I mean? Like, cause eventually I need to use a lot more than just my arm, like just to keep the torque down and like the stress off your arm. So I just, I mean, I'm still learning, but you know, I just, would literally just hammer out a bunch of research, sit down with my old pitching coach at Oklahoma Baptist, who was still there, Cody Painter at the time. And um, 
yeah just just did a lot of like one-on-one like just me and myself and i in a mound kind of just moving around on it getting comfortable so what uh i'm assuming with a with a process like that you're probably somewhat prone to mistakes and learning from them what are some of the things i mean you kind of hinted at like you can't throw every day Mm -hmm. what are some of the things that you pick up that's just like wow until i got into this i had no clue i mean throwing programs for one like i i'm i mean I still don't know a little bit, but I mean, I'm learning my body and everybody's mm-hmm. body's different. Like there's not like a certain throwing program, like, oh, you throw a hundred throws today, this day, that day, and then you're going to throw 95. Like, no, it just doesn't work that way. So I think just learning how much to throw, when to throw, long toss, not long toss. Cause I mean, for me, like I built up my arm through long toss and I know that works for me. Like mm-hmm. it's, you know, like weighted balls are a good tool and everything like that. But I, I, I stay away from that because my arm is still so fresh and so new that like I, I threw 95 without weighted balls without this stuff, you know, so I, I think there's a different path for me. Um, and I, I don't know, it's just like I said, just a lot of like just for the learning aspect of like, you know, if I threw too much that day and I was a certain amount of soreness in my shoulder or my arm or whatever, it's just learning like how to maintain and how to manage that soreness and just throwing program. Do you feel like you have, it sounded like you were fairly confident as a position player back in the college days, even though you had some issues obviously with the draft and you had Mm -hmm. some issues with the Otters and the independent league. Do you feel confidence yet as a pitcher or is that still something you're working on? Um, it's still, I mean, I, I honestly, I do feel very confident as a pitcher. I think, one, because I used to be a hitter, mm-hmm. and I used to know, like, what used to go on in my head as a hitter. And, like... So you can mess with them. <laughs> literally. Like, sometimes <laughs> I'm like, I mean, when I was a hitter, like, even at the, even when I was rolling and hot, like, there'd still be at-bats where, like, I can't sniff a pitch at all. Like, there's no way I'm hitting this guy, you know? Yeah. And I, I just think that, honestly, I think... I, after being on both sides, I think pitchers do have the advantage. Like, oh, you yeah. know, mentally, yeah. I mean, it's it's in your hands, you know, and um, and it like the adrenaline. Like I said, I always I, I refer to adrenaline because it's new. Like as a position player, you don't really get like the adrenaline. Like you do maybe after a home run, and then you're rounding second, and then you go to the dugout, and it's over. You know <laughs> what I mean? But as a pitcher, when you're out there, it's just a different like feeling, and like it's so much more emotional. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And and it's it's exciting. So I think honestly, I do feel pretty confident, like on the mound. So I think as baseball fans, we have this like weird affinity with two way players. Like there's just something about it. Like ever since the beginning, right? You got Babe Ruth, and then when I was growing up, it was Rick Ankiel, who mm-hmm. like did the opposite of what you did, obviously, but started out as a pitcher, had the yips, went to the outfield, and started you know slugging for the Cardinals. And then now you've got Shohei Otani and people like that. We just have this affinity with people that can do both, but it's going by the wayside because obviously National League now with, you know, DHs and stuff like that. Is there a little bit part of you that's a little salty where it's like, man, if I would have if I would have kept going, like I would have a chance to have some bats and you can remind people like, hey, I know you guys may not know it, but I also hit bombs. Yeah, yeah. Um, salty, no. I, I think like, I mean, I, I watched some players that still play today and – you know, in the back of my head, in the competitive side, I'm like, oh, I'm better than that guy. You know, I can go <laughs> hit a home run right now. You know what I mean? Or I can go strike out a bunch of times too. You know. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I think, I mean, I think there was a there, there's a reason why it was converted as a pitcher and and how it worked out. Um, and like I said, still like competitively, of course, I'd love to hit. But I mean, what Shohei Otani does right now, it's unbelievable. It's, like I think it's literally he's, insane. It's it's yeah. it's, ri- it's ridiculous. Yeah. yeah, it's a video game. Yeah, you know, and he should be the highest paid b- baseball player. You know what I mean? Like he does it all. And I, I don't know. It's it, watching him like doing what he does is it's pretty amazing. Especially being on both sides. Like I used to hit home runs, now I pitch, and and seeing him do both at the same time at that level is very impressive. Um, just the, the, the mentality. I mean, you spoke a little bit to it, like having to completely change your mentality. He's changing it literally sometimes from day to day <laughs> or at the inning, major yeah. league level <laughs> yes. where everyone, you know, every yeah. every guy on the mound is probably trying to come at him because mm-hmm. he's the stud. Every guy that comes up to the plate against him, you know, it's like they're going to get, he's going to get everyone's best effort, mm-hmm. right? And, and that's just something like to be able to do it at that level when everyone's giving you their best effort it's just unconscionable yeah it's it's unbelievable it, it really is so then is there maybe a little part of you that goes to Laharen's like hey 
maybe if there's like an opportunity, like I'd like to go out and take a couple <laughs> swings. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, man. You're still available as a pinch hitter, yeah, is what you're saying? Yeah, if we need it, absolutely. I think like it's, there's gonna come it's a time where man. he's gonna need a pinch hitter. <laughs> so it's like riding a bike. You know yeah, I mean? like it, absolutely, you can still swing it. So I mean, you're just totally going for the fence in that situation, I would assume, right? Yeah, you're not up there to hit a single at right, that point, right? It would go, it would go against everything that I learned in college about myself as hitting because that doesn't work that way when you swing for the fences every time. But I definitely would be swinging for the fences. You guys take batting practice or anything yet here this year? No, we have not. Oh, that's no. My has, has the DH like? I mean, is there is there pitchers batting practice planned? Have you started like lobbying for this stuff yet? Uh, this could be yet. the next thing. This AC Ducey yeah. on the line pitcher batting practice. There we go. We don't need dollar bills, right? We need no. We need like actual like put me in the game. Yeah, yeah. Because the funniest thing about pitcher VP is it's where like you know little league stories and high school stories go to die. Where it's like, oh, I used to, I, you know, I used to hit bombs in high school or whatever, and then they go out there and they whiff like four times in a row, and you're like. Really? Yeah. Like, are you sure? Yeah. Are you sure yeah. those stories were completely true? Like, yeah. I feel like you would be one of those that they go out there like, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Jake's yeah. Got, he's got video evidence, man. Yeah, I saw it. Bunch, it's on the yeah, internet. Yeah, Let's go to the film here. Yeah, everybody can look it up. But, yeah, it's. It, I might have to present that to Larry. Like, I hey, think that's a heck of an idea. Yeah. yeah right? Yeah. We'll lobby for you. Yeah. Right. Perfect. You know, you know, so you go to Vegas and these guys are putting, like, you know, pink slips and stuff down. I'm like, no, I just I just want an at-bat. Yeah. Yep. That's easy. Yep. You know, it doesn't cost him anything. <laughs> Might, you know, he might have to explain a few things to the yeah. brass down in Cincinnati, but <laughs> right, right. It's, it's not like yeah, it's not like you don't know what you're doing out there. Yeah, exactly. Got it. So tell us a little bit about this year's team because obviously we're sitting here first week of May. Yep. You guys are killing it, right? Best, Best record, record in in all of minor league baseball, baseball at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, Got gotten off to an incredibly hot start. start. What do you attribute that success to right now, as as far as this team and what's special about them? Um, I mean, if you just like step, because. If you just step in the locker room right now and kind of look around and just hang out for like 10 minutes, like it, it, we've got a really good group of guys. Like we have a really good, a lot of good characters and we're just meshing well. And like that's so important, like yeah. to win in a baseball game. Just because if you're, if you're not meshing in the locker room, like you're not going to mesh on the field. And we just mesh in the locker room right now. And I mean, our pitching staff, we're really close. And I mean, we're just, we're throwing the ball well and we're, we're hitting when we need to. You know, and like uh, the crazy stat I was telling you guys is like when we're up, you know, when it's a two zero ball game, we're ten and all. You know, we're up by two runs. So it's it's just you know, it's just all timely hitting and good pitching right now. It's it's working out. Did that cohesiveness in the locker room was that from day one when you guys came here to take a little bit to kinda of get into the groove and feel people out and kind of build that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean so luckily like a lot of the guys were in Daytona last year. I mean, because when you come up through an organization, like you, you've been around a lot of the guys, like yeah. either in spring training, AZL, Daytona, whatever level you've been at. So yeah. I think that it just kind of worked out that we've all kind of, a lot of the guys have played with each other before and kind of know each other. And, and um, like I said, it's just, it's just really meshing. How much does the coaching staff have to do with something like that? I mean, it, it, I've gotten, we've gotten to talk to Brian. He was on our podcast a little bit earlier this year and, you know, some, some sporadically during batting practice and things we'll chat with him. Seems, Seems like a really nice guy. guy. Mm-hmm. Seems like he's good. He's younger than probably most of the managers that we've had around here in our 22-year history. Do things like that help, or is that something where you guys kind of just do it all on your own? Uh, no, I, I think I think uh, the coaching staff plays a big role. Um, Lahair does a great job. Garmin does a great job. I mean, they they're they're for the players. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I think as you, the longer you're in the game, you kind of run into coaching, the coaching staff and managers who are kind of in it for, for maybe them or, you know, whatever the situation is. But Lahair and Garmin, they're, they're there for the players, and the players know that, and we see that. And it just it, it makes everything a lot better. So uh, what, what kind of things should we be looking for as the season progresses, right? Still early. You guys have had a lot of early success, and that's great, right? You, you get things off on, the th- on, on a good foot. What, what happens as we get through, go through May into June? What are some of the things that you've seen in your history of, of playing ball at the collegiate level and now at the professional level that the average fan should pay attention to to see, like, is the team still gelling? How are things going? Are we, you know, are we looking at a championship kind of season? What are all those things that you guys are going to be focused on that might be of interest to the fans to pay attention to? Yeah, I think, I mean, just coming from – like on the team standpoint, like the player competitive standpoint, it's like it, teams are going to adjust, right? Mm-hmm. Like eventually teams are going to adjust to how we pitch. Eventually they're going to adjust how we hit. 
and um, I think that it's going to be pretty cool because we do have a group of guys that I think is going to be able to adjust. You know what I mean? Like, and, and just and just go with the go with the waves. You know, because it's such a long year, like yeah. 140 games or, or whatever it is, is so long. You know, yeah. Yeah. and it's just. We're know, in the front office, trust us, we know. Yeah, you guys know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but, yeah, I think it's just staying, you know, staying positive and, and just adjusting. And I think this team, it's, it's going to, we're going to do some special things. Yeah, so, so I mean, it's, it's not just other teams adjusting, but then you have to adjust to their adjustments and it's just a never-ending cycle, right? right. You're Who always, can stay one step ahead? Yep, you're always adjusting and you're always making, you know, m- making different moves and, you know, just going with it, so. How does your mentality change in a league like this where there's a, a playoff race that can end halfway through the season versus all your long like longevity versus, hey, we've kind of got two splits here? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like I said, it's, it's a long year, and I think it'll be, it'll be my first year like seeing playoffs because last year we didn't have playoffs. So mm-hmm. it, that'll be all new to me too, like in an all-star break and, and, and all of that. So... You know, as long I think as long as like the core stays together, you know, because there's going to be moves. It's sure. just part of professional baseball, which is good. The movement's good. Um, but uh, yeah, as long as the core stays together, I think we shouldn't have any issues. So individually, then for you, did you come into the season with a personal goal of like, hey, I want to either get better at something, or by the end of the season, I want to be here with this? Like, did you have some sort of threshold where you're kind of working toward by the end of the year? Yeah, I mean, we always like you if. You always have goals coming into the year, and I think a, a big one for me is one to stay healthy. Like staying healthy is because if you're not healthy, then you know you're not moving anywhere. You're not being promoted. You're not you know playing. Then, um, but yeah, as long as I, I like I said, honestly, that's the biggest goal. Just to stay healthy, and everything else will, will work work itself out. So yeah. So you mentioned in there the All Star break, right? The, the and, and we know All Star breaks, off days, things like that. Those are golden because you're playing 160 plus games in like 170 days, right? There's not a lot of them. So tell us what what's life like for you away from the stadium, right? I mean, this is probably your third or fourth city in a few years here. What do you do when you're not at the ballpark? Um, really, just like play golf. I mean. Uh, when I after after I graduated college, I really got into golf. Um, didn't wasn't really into golf because it would mess with my swing. I would like because now. Yeah. But um, no, I don't have to worry about that. That's why pitchers are so good at golf, right? Yeah, they don't, yeah, they don't yeah, have to yeah. worry about it. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, play golf. Just like honestly, think about everything but baseball because it's such a long day and it's hard to do, right? Yeah. Especially after you pitch, like you're, you know, because after I throw, like I don't get the best sleep, you know, just because you're always thinking about the outing and you're thinking about oh, you could have done this, whatever. Um, but yeah, just hang out, relax, watch a movie, um, hang out with the roommates. Um, I got a good core roommates, Nick Hanson and Carson Rudd. So we just hang out, play some cards. A lot of cards. We do play. It sounds like there's play a lot, lot of cards. cards. We, we got a lot of cards yeah, this year, huh? Yeah, a lot of cards just because, I mean, we're so competitive that like, you know, we got to compete in something, you know, and I don't really play video games, so it's not really my thing, but yeah. yeah. So. Do you find that's a trait that a lot of professional baseball players you've been around is just the, the competitive and no matter what they're doing? Yeah, absolutely. I think I think it's just kind of part of our nature, you know. So nobody, nobody wants to lose here, huh? No, it doesn't matter what it is. You know? uh, You'll yeah. make up a new game if it means that you can win it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's the whole reason ACDC came to be in existence, right? <laughs> I feel like we're much. gonna be watching the World Series of Poker at like three a.m. in twenty years, and you see Jake up there just like hat down, absolutely. Hat down. Like, yeah. <laughs> Who's this six five guy? How did he get on the main right. table? Yep, yep, <laughs> exactly. right. Good. Well, hey, thanks so much for joining us on the podcast today. We appreciate everything. Uh, We appreciate the time. We're glad that you're here in Dayton. We're glad you guys are having so much success. And uh, we hope that it it stays up for you and you stay healthy and all the goals that you were looking for. But again, thanks thanks so much for your time today and telling us a little bit about your story. Yeah, thank you guys. Appreciate it.